Good evening and welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub. Tonight we have our uh, 1871 CEC winner of the Momentum Award, a prestigious award won by many of our great founders and great companies here in town. The founder of KCURA, Andrew Sage. Andrew, great to have you here. Thank you. Sure, it's a privilege. Welcome, welcome. So um, this is one of the great companies in Chicago. I think anybody who knows it knows what an exciting story it is, how it's, it, will, it already is one of the great uh, startup success stories here, but as a B2B company that serves, well, a large vertical, one that not everybody works in, um, maybe for the uninitiated, how would you best describe what KCURA does? Yeah. Uh, so at KCURA, we make a, a software product called Relativity, and Relativity is a document management system designed for discovery, and so what, what is legal discovery. So what is legal discovery? So when uh, there's, maybe there's two companies that are involved in a dispute, they're suing each other, uh, side A needs to hand over all information about the matter over to side B and vice versa. And uh, if you've ever been involved in one of these things, it's, it's big, it's messy, it's nasty, and it's really, really expensive. And what we do is we take all this information, and in modern business, it's the emails, the documents, the spreadsheets. So in course, the old days, people would have to go through their files and find all the correspondence and all the memos. But electronically, it's got to be massive. Yeah, it's it's a tremendous amount of information. Think about all the emails that you might get like today, and then compound that by five years. Right. Right. So, you know, we take all this information, and we have technology that can collect it, and then we have technology that normalizes it, and then we have technology where you can put it into a database, where then armies of attorneys can search it, review it, and find out what's relevant and not relevant. And you know, we have traditional methods, and then we have methods that use artificial intelligence and machine learning to help separate the relevant information from the junk. And then we have technology where you can ultimately, what's called production, get it ready for the courts. And then, then the attorneys can actually go through and like kind of build their case with the software as well. So we cover the entire gamut of legal discovery. That's am it's amazing if you think that literally people go through millions of emails. And so imagine the alternative of going through millions of emails if you didn't have it. I mean, it's crazy. Like, uh, you know, not even as long as maybe like in 2005, um, you know, there's still tons of law firms that were just printing this stuff out and then having like all these associates just read them manually and uh, you know the whole digit to take um, making this stuff digital and computerized was actually a bit more recent. Right well I had a friend who was a wannabe environmental lawyer and the first thing they gave him was they set him in a conference room for a year and had him flip page after page doing this because they had a lawyer do it and that was one year as a lawyer his whole life he'd worked to become an environmental lawyer and he thought this is the worst job in the world because there was no relativity back then. It yeah. shows you the, the pain point for sure. He felt it. Um, so you're a programmer by background, not a lawyer. So how yeah. did the, where did the idea come from? Yeah, so uh, programmer by trade. Um, I started, I started Kikura back in 2001 as a, as a software consulting firm. And so our business was, you know, building custom software products for our clients. And in 2002, a a law firm hired us to uh, build this document management system. Um, it was fully in Lardner, and we, uh, we gave them the initial bid on uh, the project. They're like, whoa, this uh, price tag is way too high. I'm like, well, you know, if we keep the intellectual property, I'll give you a 40% discount. They're like, deal. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how we kept the IP to the project. And how you became a product company. Yeah. How, yeah, and but that was that was in 2002. That was oh, in 2002, wow. and then we you know we kept the the IP. No, in 2002 we started the negotiations. We finally closed the deal in 2004, and uh, but it wasn't until 2007 where we kind of pivoted to the business and then moved away from consulting to just focus on wow. on relative. Well, this is a great story, and this is a really interesting story about how to get a great startup. But let's go back. Yeah. Let's go back to the beginning. So, um, as a kid. You became a programmer. Were you always a programmer? You, you, you know, the computer was always a uh, was always a hobby of mine. You know, I was I was lucky enough for when my my father bought me like a uh, a computer when I was I think in, in third or fourth grade, and uh, I used to program basic on it and used to make little games, and then uh, got one of those PCs when I was uh, a teenager in high school, and really got into technology then and. You, know, you started. You started a technology-enabled business. What in the ninth grade was it? Oh well, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, it was. So there, there was a little stint where I was really into like graphic design and like desktop publishing, and mm -hmm. uh, I bought a book at a bookstore and like how to how to 
start a desktop publishing business. And, and how old were you? I was, I was, in, I was a freshman in high school. And so uh, I read this book and I got really enamored in, in the whole idea of, of, of graphics and design and, and page layout. And, and uh, I convinced my father to buy me a laser printer. And that was a, a lot of money at the time. It was yeah. 900 bucks or something like that. And I got my laser printer and then I made a bunch of ads. I, and I went door to door in like Hamtramck, right, which is like a... Uh, Tell people, not everyone may know Hamtramck. Yeah, Hamtramck is like, uh, it's, it's in Detroit. It's like the equivalent of like Cicero. You know how like Cicero is surrounded by Chicago, but a fundamentally it's Chicago. So Hamtramck is effectively Detroit and it's this small little community there. And I just ran around Hamtramck uh, giving these flyers out for my desktop publishing business. And um, you know, one, of the, one of the businesses that I gave the, the, the flyer to was a place called America Speeding Printing, which was like a printing shop. And uh, they just brought me on board and contracted work to me to do like menus and you know funeral epitaphs and <laughs> all kinds of weird like brochures for car washes and, and how'd it go uh, I probably made a few hundred bucks but uh, you know it was it was a cool experience and I remember just being really proud to yeah. you know get a client deliver a product and make 30 bucks you know I thought That's that was awesome. really cool that is awesome yeah. especially as a kid I mean it feels great as a 20 something but as a kid Incredible. Yeah. So uh, you solved the problem right there. You also um, you also were uh, worked on a money app. You, you told me. Yeah. So uh, the, so the pro programming the computer was always like a hobby for me, and uh, I'd always cook up like these these projects uh, for, for for me to work on, and they always had like some type of entrepreneurial spin. And uh, when I was a little bit older, I think it was uh, it was more of like a, uh, a late sophomore in high school. Um, I had this idea to build a Quicken for Polish people. So I'm Polish, and uh, and I know the language, and so and I was and at the time I was really into like managing all my finances in this program called Managing Your Money, which is like a well, you made all the money from the first job. I mean, yeah, come on. you know, like I, I needed you know good accounting practices. Exactly. And so I worked on this program to build effectively you know uh, General Ledger, and there was a checking app, and but it was all in Polish. Wow. So how was it to how it. was it to do? Uh, it was fun. You know, like uh, I enjoyed I, I really enjoyed the process of like programming the creativity. I I loved um, you know there's you know there's there, I, f I feel very fortunate to be a like software engineer. I think it's uh I think it's a very special trait in that uh, you know sometimes there's this perception that like you know programmers are just these geeks you put into the closet, right? Nothing is more annoying to me like when business people like minimize the work that we do, you know. Like, oh yeah, I'll just hire some guys and they'll build it, you know. And um, but anyways, it's it's not that. It's it's a job that is, you know, requires a lot of creativity. It's a job that uh, um, requires some business sense and savvy. And I think what's really special about programming is that you know we can be a couple programmers and we have some problem to solve. We have to build this bottle, right? And you might build this bottle, and I might build this bottle, and we might build it to the exact same spec, but inside how it's built, mm -hmm. it might have signatures of like the way I do things, mm -hmm. right? And yours will have signatures of how you do things. And when you look at the code and the way it's designed and when it's laid out, you might see like, oh yeah, Pat wrote this stuff. Right? And yours would be the clean, elegant code. Mine would be the kludgy code, but. Depends on the timeline, right? <laughs> how aggressive we had to get things out the door, but. Uh, but I think that's really special, and I think also with like programming is you know like you think about other engineering dis disciplines, um, you know if you're like a structural engineer and you build this bridge, I mean you got to get this bridge right because if you don't, you're pretty much screwed. Right. But if we build the bottle wrong, something internally about it, well you know what, we just rebuild it, hit F5, and there you go, you got a brand new bottle. That's right. right? That's right. So it's interesting. You got, you got these entrepreneurial experience in high school, but you moved around a lot yeah. in your youth. Um, how did that shape? sort of who you became and, and, and your, your own path? Because I think you said you went to, you saw the world, or at least the country. The, uh, yeah, so I, we, my mother moved around a lot. So I, at, growing up, I went to uh, seven different grade schools and five different high schools. And, you know, for me, it was always, it was always, yeah, I just went to a new school every year, right? And it wasn't a big deal, and I'd meet some new kids. And, um, and depending where I went, you know, I fit in, and sometimes I didn't. You know, sometimes I did it, and uh, that kind of sucked. But, but the times where I didn't fit in, right, I always had, 
it's going to sound real nerdy, I had my, my computer to like entertain me. Right. And um, you know, if it wasn't for those, you know, those few years where you know, it wasn't as fun, right, I probably wouldn't develop the, the knack. You know? mm -hmm. so. And I'm sure the kids who went to school with you, seeing where you are now, which they had to develop the knack and stayed home when we're doing it, because it's, it's worked pretty well. Uh, I'm sure they don't remember me. <laughs> yeah. Well, they'll watch this. They'll, they'll see what they missed. It's, uh, but I think that's an interesting one. If you, if you look at our founders here, everybody ended up one way or another really having, many of them having a deep connection to whether it's technology or, or one of your mentors. I know Mark Tebby talked about farm equipment. Yeah. I mean, there was something that got them to sort of develop that, I think, at an earlier age. And um, it's not 100% consistent, but it's a theme that we see a lot. And I think it says something about, um, you know, how entrepreneurs and creative yeah. people uh, develop. Yeah, well, part, part of it's also like, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs might be like the master technician first, mm -hmm. and then they start their business, right? Like I'm, you know, a great cook, and I'm a chef, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that, I'm going to start a restaurant, right? You're, you're, the, you're the master technician, and then you start your business. And so if you're going to be a master in something, you need the 10,000 hours, right? Like mm -hmm. according to like what? Oh, Speak up. Can you guys hear me now? Is that better? Oh my gosh, why didn't you say something? <laughs> you didn't have to do the sign. Oh, oh so when you, when you talk about, uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, being a, uh, a master in something, it requires the 10,000 hours, right? And so you got, if you start something when you're like a kid, well, you just build all those hours, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. No, it's a, yeah. there's no question. And it's uh, yeah, the famous uh, Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours. Yeah. So um, you obviously went on to great success, and you were very successful. Those of you were, who was here for the Mark Tebby founder stories a couple months back? Okay, it was a great one. If you haven't seen it, check it out online. You get to hear about what Bill Gates was like when he was young. What, um, who else did he say, Beth? Uh, um, Michael Dell. What? Who else? Michael Dell. I mean, it was, you know, uh, Bill Gurley when he was uh, building a hardware, a compact. I mean, it was a fascinating story. But he was your former boss, and I know he's a mentor and a friend and a, a huge fan of yours. And he talked about what a great employee you were and how he was sad to lose you but also excited. But the path from coding in high school to there is not a, to Lante was not a traditional one. No. might be more, tr more common now. Peter Thiel's bribing people to go do these things. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that road and, and how you turned it into a success. Because it's not, it's not the standard cookie-cutter road, but it was an incredibly successful one for you yeah. coming out of high school to Lante. Yeah. So when I when I when I graduated when I graduated high school, uh, I decided that I was gonna go to Northern Illinois University and sit and, and study computer science. And I got to Northern, I was going to classes and I didn't really I was never really one that enjoyed school and school wasn't really for me. And then uh, it was very easy for me to like just not go to class and find some other activities to like entertain myself in and uh, Lo and behold, like a year later, I failed out of all my classes and I got kicked out of Northern. And um, I had to do something, right? And so uh, I was gonna go to the, the community college up at Northern, it's called Kishwaukee, right? I was just gonna get an apartment there with some of my friends, tell my mom that I'm still kinda going to Northern. <laughs> and, uh, it's a good and, strategy. Yeah, you know, like it was very important for my mom to like continue like the, to continue education, right? And so. And so that was my plan. And then my buddy, my buddy was going to DeVry, and he's like, uh, he was telling me about the school. He's like, yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, I'm just doing the technology stuff, and maybe you should look into it. And I went over there, and, you know, they had a program in computer science and, or technology, whatever they called it. And I'm like, ah, you know what, maybe this would be a better thing for me. And so I started to go to DeVry, and maybe like my, my, my first or second week in the school, they had a career fair for graduating seniors. And I'm like, you know, screw it. I'll just go and see if I can get a job. And, and when I was why, at, why take all the classes? Go for the job. Go get a good job. And I remember I had a, I was in a fraternity at Northern. And I had like a really cheap like blue suit. I spent like maybe like sixty bucks on it, like Burlington Coat Factory. And I put my cheap blue suit on and I, you know, walked walked through. There was a big shape as a big U. And I remember like my pitch in the beginning. So how again, was your how was your pitch? What was your pitch like in the beginning? It was pretty rough in the beginning. I don't even remember, right? But it was pretty rough in the beginning. But by the time I got to the end, uh, my pitch was pretty sound and I ended up getting a interviews. So I, inter I remember I interviewed at Accenture, I interviewed at, uh, at Siemens and one other place and I ended up getting a job. 
So as like a this is like MVP selling yourself at 19. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so I ended up getting a, a PC fix it. I was the desktop support guy for a division of Siemens mm -hmm. up in Buffalo Grove. Okay. So you're so, working at did you still do school at all? Yeah, so I went to school at nights for the next uh, four or five years, as I no longer than that, for the next uh, six years as I was working full time. And so how'd you go from Siemens to Lante? And yeah. how'd you move from desktop support to coding? Yeah, so. Because uh, Lante had a great engineering talent. So it says a lot about what you could do that you went there, because the, I know the bar was very high. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so at Siemens, I started out in desktop support, and then I got into server administration, and then it became like a, a systems architect. And then here's the true story, right? I was, uh, Siemens had like this, you know, this big annual picnic and they had a karaoke contest at the picnic. <laughs> and then uh, me and another buddy, we like sang at the karaoke contest and, you know, we made the finals and we were very entertaining. <laughs> and this, this guy, Jay Munz, who like led the, the Latte office for Chicago, like who led the Chicago Latte office, I was like, who is that guy, blah, blah, blah. He's like in IT and all this other stuff. And he came up to me. He's like, you got to come to work at Lante. And I got an interview. And <laughs> off your singing. Off the goofy karaoke contest, yeah. Nice. And, uh, hey, man. And you can't write this stuff. Would no one believe it? It's a true story, man. It's awesome. Yeah. So that's great. It's a great story. So, yeah. so you go to interview at Lante. And how do you make the move from system administration into straight up to programming? programming? Yeah, so Lante hired, hired me as a system administrator. And so like my involvement in these e-commerce projects would be to like help set up the servers and the testing infrastructure and all that stuff. And uh, you know, I got the job in, in 2000 and they put me in this thing called the Event Systems Group, which was, um, you know, we'd help set up these large networks for these trade shows. And I did that for about nine months and then they put me on a, they decided to shut that business down, and then I was just became another line engine, uh, like line consultant. And then the the bust happened, the bust happened, and then uh, basically sat on the bench for six months, and you know decided I was going to try to be productive and learned all the professional programming tools. I got fully certified in every like Microsoft certification you can get. You guys were a big Microsoft shop, weren't you? Uh, you know, it was a mix. It was a mix of Microsoft and Java, depending on, you know, the client. I know you guys did our project in Java, but I know Mark was very close with the Microsoft people. I yeah, it was, uh, they did a lot of business for Microsoft. And so I learned the tools. I asked to be put on some programming projects. They put me on uh, a project. Turns out I was pretty good at it, you know, in terms of doing it professionally. And, um, and then they staffed me on a project working for Microsoft in Seattle. Um, you know, Microsoft is coming out with their latest collaboration platform called Exchange 2000, and they hired Lante to build a reference architecture and demo application showcasing the platform. And um, I, led, I led the project and had a small team. And, and uh, that, that's really that particular project and the stuff that I learned on that project was like the impetus to like start Kate Cura. So, so let, me, let me ask you one thing. Um, there's a moment in time where you're still going to classes at night, yeah. in theory, to get the job you already have. Yeah. So at what point did you sort of say, this is crazy, like trying to do both and focus just on accelerating your career? Yeah, it was just, uh, it's, I was just traveling a lot for work and then it just became impractical to, to, to do the, uh, to go to night school. And you know what, it was, it was like the late 90s and it was crazy in the late 90s. Yeah, right. right. You can flip on a computer, you could probably get a decent job, right? So, um, and I was getting a, a really nice salary and um, yeah, so I decided not to go. But I, I'll tell you this, but in, in the professional world, you know, not having the, the, the college education, not having the university degree was, uh, it was definitely a stigma and I felt it and it was, uh, it was strange, you know, it was strange to get that and you feel like, you know, people ask you like, what school did you go to? And I'm like, Right, and how's it? Does it get easier as you've gotten more successful? Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a badge of honor now. Now it? it is a badge of honor. Yeah. You, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. I mean, you're in good company. Peter Thiel's paying people to drop out of school. Like yeah. it's. But you know, it, listen. I think it's it is one of those binary things, though. Like if you know, it, it's. Uh, we were talking about it before. It's it is a shortcut for people, sort of. I think it. I think it's school. Let's face it. School is not for everybody, right? And right. there there are there are probably better and more efficient ways to learn a trade and, uh, and a profession. And so, oh, why does this keep on happening? Is this better?
Okay, how about this? Okay. So yeah, school, school is, uh, it's not necessarily for everybody and there's probably more efficient ways to like learn a profession. And so. Uh, I'd say if you look at the entrepreneurs we have, there are a group of them who are like hardcore, like I want to go to MIT, like Chris Gladwin and do that. And then there's a group who are like, you know, school is sort of like what I was doing part time while I was doing what I really loved. Yeah. And I think you, that's like more common pattern amongst entrepreneurs. And um, there's no question what I did in college is very little to do with what I do today. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting how the world evolves. And obviously, you know, you've done an incredible job with it. So you're, you're at Lante, you're leading a team, you're working on this really cool technology, which yeah. not everybody will be able to appreciate the dynamics of it. But you obviously have achieved a lot of success, but we're also hitting the, the bubbles bursting. It's bursted. It bursted. So the, the bubble has burst. We're sitting there, and you, um, you decide to leave. Yeah. And Mark said straight up, like, he didn't want you to leave. Yeah. His comment was, he's like, you guys came to him and said, hey, we think we want to go do this, so if you're going to give people, you know, packages, can you give us a package so you can help us transition into our new job? And he's like, I hate to see him go, but they're great guys, and they're, and I, you know, I want to be supportive of entrepreneurs. And so, but most people wouldn't have jumped off a ship in that kind of economy, let alone to go do their own business. What, what got you excited about the opportunity that eventually we started as the consulting firm? Yeah, so one, I guess, it was a bold I, move. Yeah, I, I guess you just like see like what the opportunity was. I mean, we, uh, so, you know, Microsoft was coming out with Exchange 2000. They had this thing called the web storage system, which is, you know, you could think of it as, a, it was like a NoSQL database of like, 2000 and technology was really compelling and um, they were going to make a big push in in in, in corporate America to, to, to unseat like Lotus Notes which was the number one collaboration platform at the time and push ex exchange 2000 and uh, I was an expert in this stuff mm -hmm. I mean I knew this stuff inside and out there's I'm the one who built like the with the team we, we built like a reference architecture as to how to do this and and we had some great relationships inside Microsoft, and so why don't we just try it? I mean, the opportunity just seemed really good. Right. You know? And so, you, so you get out there, and how was the market? Sorry. Oh, yeah. And, oh, this is some other thing I forgot. Like, so like, so the idea, the idea was we were going to quit our jobs and get independent consulting gigs, so making like whatever independently, and then pull up some money and then officially start the practice. That was the plan. Mm -hmm. And then... I was snowboarding in, uh, in, in, in Vail, right? And I was thinking like, hey, I should, I should get my independent consulting gig in Denver and I can live out here for three months and do some snowboarding. And so yeah. was, that was the plan. <laughs> and, and so I, I go online and I, I, I go check out like hot jobs and there's like a posting on hot jobs for like an Exchange 2000 developer in Denver. Right? I, as you're out snowboarding. As I'm out snowboarding. And so I call the recruiter the next day. I get an interview lined up. I call like my, my, my girlfriend at the time and she FedExed my suit to Vail. <laughs> Same one or a new one? This is a new one now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but still bought at the Burlington Coat Factory. <laughs> um, and then I drove into Denver and I remember the drive being real perilous. It was like, you know, it was like snowing and the roads were all crazy. and. I was tired, and uh, and I, I went through the the interview process the next day. And by the end of the day, you know, they were telling me more about the project. And I'm like, I go, well, we can build this for you. I got a team in Chicago that can just do this the entire thing for you. And I go from wanting to apply, get an independent consulting gig, to signing a three hundred thousand dollar job. Wow. And then with that, we went to heavy and quit. <laughs> well, that's impressive. Yeah. Wow. So you. So your snowboarding, I think I want to hang out and be close to the, to yeah. the mountains, turned into a $300,000 contract to start the business. Start the business, yeah. How cool. Interesting. Dumb luck. Hey, it's there's all about making of, your breaks. It's all, there's a lot of dumb luck. Um, so you make your break on that, and the business side goes well, but the, the founder thing is, is not, it's not the perfect marriage. Yeah, yeah so. Uh, what, you, what happened and what did you learn? Yeah, so Kekura, we started. Uh, you know, there was I, I had two other, two other, two other business partners with uh, Kekura when we first started the business, and you know, uh, f f f we were we were really young guys at the time. I mean, we were like 23, 24 when we started the business, and we had 
Um, you know, for me, I was probably more, I, would, I, I personally was more interested in pulling a salary and maybe developing more of a lifestyle business. And I had another partner who was, he was very more focused on, you know, b building the business, growing it, turning it to something probably more meaningful. And then there was another one who was indifferent. And, um, you know, ultimately the dynamic didn't work out. And so we decided to separate ways. And how'd you end up with the brand and how'd that all come it, about? Yeah, it was just like a, an auction process between, uh, between the two of us. And I basically decided to pay more money for, you know, the brand and some of the existing projects that we had going. It's ironic that you were the one who wanted a lifestyle business because it's become anything but a lifestyle business. It's become an incredible business. Um, and I, I want to talk about that, but you, there's this important moment you talked about in the beginning, which was you got this Foley and Lardner contract uh, to build this system for them. You negotiated keeping the IP rights, so you owned the product that you built for them as part of the deal. Um, yet there's several years, three years between then and becoming a product company. Talk about both that journey from like what happened and also were you dying to be a product company or did it take you time to figure out that was the best path? Yeah, no, no, the, the, we, we always wanted to be a software company. And even when we first started Kcura, we had this, this tool called the K-Store Explorer, which was like a, kind of like a development platform for the web storage system. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was like our first product, and that didn't go anywhere. And uh, over time, we would do uh, all these other projects, and we would productize them. We had like a collaborative extranet for a law firm. We had, uh, that was called Convergence. So uh, were they all, were the original projects all things that became, um, started as projects and then became products? Yes. Got it. Yes. So how did you figure out which product to ride? Like which was the which was the one? That I didn't really figure anything. I was the one that people wanted to buy. Well, but talk about yeah. that because I think that sounds easy now. But yeah. when you're looking at it, figuring it out, you know, you, there's lots of ways you can go. A lot of them lead to dead ends. Yeah, you know, I think it's just part of the hustle and you know, building a business. So we had these three different products, and 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 over time, like our consulting practice shifted to uh, just focus specifically on building solutions for these large law firms, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, and so as we, we'd be in there like pitching like other work, we'd like, hey, we, by, the, by the way, we've got these other, other solutions. You know, we got this extra net, we got this data management tool for you, and we got this litigation tool. And the litigation tool was the one that seemed like had the, the greatest need in the marketplace. You know, we sold it once and we sold it again and then sold it a third time. And then the fourth time we sold the, uh, the solution, you know, we kind of knew we had something there. Interesting. So... I want to go back. One of the things we talk about here at Founder Stories is founder market fit. Yeah. And there's teams to be, there are two ways founders can sort of figure out their space. I've never seen a successful founder who didn't understand the business they're in from the inside out. One way is to be the person who has the problem, right? Sometimes you just code your own solution to it. Uh, the other is to learn it for, you know, from the inside out. Um, you obviously learned it because you weren't doing discovery as lawyers. Um, talk about but it's interesting, I, I mentioned before, you'll be with him tomorrow night, John Ayello from Savo. Savo started as a consulting business, now the leader in sales enablement software as a SaaS company. We use them. Oh yeah, they're great. Yeah. And uh, so talk a little bit about maybe your, that non-traditional path. I, mean, I know you did it to make money and do things, but what was the benefit of being a software, of being a consulting firm to find and figure out the market? And would you, did that just happen to work then or would you recommend that to others? I, I love the work that we did as, as, a, as a consulting business. I thought it was really, uh, I thought it was really rewarding and fun to walk into a business and speak with people who are experts in whatever their domain is and get quickly like ramped up and mm -hmm. then talk at their level and help them solve their problems. And um, I thought that was really cool. And I think, and I think the kind of the advantage in like going into a problem space completely green is that you don't have any preconceived notions. And, uh, and I think it really worked well for us in building the, the litigation platform and that like all the other, what we would call next gen platforms that were coming to the marketplace at the time were all biting ideas from like the legacy systems. Hmm. Cause that's, that was their, 
frame of reference. That right. was what that's that's what the customers wanted. The customers wanted like a better summation. They wanted better better concordance, right? Like we've never seen these things or used them, and you just told us what the problem was, and we would just give you a solution that was, you know, the best fit to solve your problem. That's the uh, what they, what's the thing about Henry Ford? If you'd ask customers what they wanted, they'd say they want faster horses. Yeah. Um, so, but let's let's run with that for a minute because better whips. I think that's what he said. <laughs> yeah. um, I think one of the things that's interesting about this one, um, to me, is I think about companies when we've started and how hard it is to get the early customers to talk to you, right? Yeah. Because, and so you you actually turned it on its head, and I think a really interesting way, like you'd virtually pay people to spend time with you as a startup to say, hey, tell us what you think about this, give us as much feedback as possible, much easier to do with consumers than it is with businesses because that person has a job to do. And so the idea that you're gonna, they're gonna take hours from their job to help you with your business is always difficult. You turn it on its head, they paid you yeah. to teach you about the business, which was beautiful because they were invested in you. Yeah. Um, how important do you think that was to getting the product right? I, I think it's, it's critical, right? Like you need to, you need to make sure that your your customers ultimately bought into your solution, and they're, they are going to be committed to give you the feedback, and work with you, and more importantly, be patient with you as mm -hmm. like you work out the kinks because you're not going to get it right, mm -hmm. and there's probably going to be a ton of bugs, and so you, you need you need people to have like that that vested interest in ensuring that you're successful, and one of the ways in kind of guaranteeing that is an exchange some money. Yep. Right. Well, no, no question. So you, we, we talked before, you were talking about the fact that um, 04, you started with a product that you built for Foley and Lardner. Yeah. 07, you really took off as a company. Yeah. You had a, a, a seminal customer there that yeah. kind of helped you transform the business. Talk a little bit about how that, how that transformation came in that customer relationship and, and why they did it. I think it's really interesting, yeah. actually, why they did it. So yeah, so in, uh, in, two, in in the beginning of 2006, a um, who at the time was the largest law firm in the world um, uh, had, had had a data management problem, and so they were they were involved in a their, their client was a very large pharmaceutical company, and it was a class talk, action. Talk about where you met them. Uh, I met I met them at a trade show. It's called Legal Tech, mm -hmm. right? It's like it's actually going on like next week, uh, but like Legal Tech, it's in New York. It's a big like you know. And where do you meet the, the what's the person's name from? Uh, Tamina. Tamina yeah. from DLA Piper. DLA Piper, yes. So you meet Something Tamina, watching, yeah. and and uh, yes, yeah. you meet you meet Tamina. She's, yeah. she's this critical part of your story, though. Yeah, yeah. So T Tamina and I, we meet and we're geeking out. We're talking about technology, and it's at like at the bar. And I remember like we're drinking like uh, vodka sodas or vodka Red Bulls or whatever, whatever it was. And yes, yeah, uh, so you're you're hanging out at the bar, geeking out about technology, technology, yeah. and how it can impact her world. Yeah, and so and then they were telling they, they or they weren't a client already. Uh, no, no, they were not a client. Okay. And so then they were, they told me about like, you know, this data problem that they have. And so they were, they were the lead counsel for a large pharmaceutical company. It was involved in a class action lawsuit. And it was like one of those where they effectively had 50 data repositories and they had to consolidate them to one. And so, and, uh, and I spoke of the technology that we had. And the next thing you know, we were up in one of the hotel rooms and I'm giving a demo, like on the bed with a bunch of guys, like watching me, like <laughs> software. <laughs> And How then, many vodka sodas into the night are we? It was probably ten. Just <laughs> ten. So you you do the demo, and you get an initial. We get we get the project. Okay. Get yeah. The project. So yeah, you know, it took, it, and for, of course it took some time to get the project, and um, so we start the work in like I don't know, like May, and it was a really we we built an amazing amount of technology in like three months, an amazing amount of technology. Um, product was called like uh, Flex. So for the Take care, guys. Watching it, right? Which today is now like the underpinnings of the whole uh, object framework inside relativity. But anyways, um, so we build this thing in three months, and we go to we deploy it, and we launch it, and it was a huge disaster. We got so not now where everybody thought you were going with the story. Yeah, no, it was, yeah. It, it was a monster. It was a monstrous disaster, right? Like so. And how come? Uh, all kinds of reasons. One is, you know, getting the data in the system was a huge mess. Uh, we got some of the requirements wrong. There was performance issues. There were stability issues, and there was a handful of pa paralegals in uh, in New York who were like the champions of the software. And there was these mean, like these mean New York women, you know, and they would just get on the phone and just let us have it on how 
how big piece of the shit this, this, this product was. And um, doesn't make the best marketing. Yeah, no. And but all, all, all we could have done was like, yep, it's uh, this, this thing is not working right. And then uh, we'd, we'd, we'd go back and we'd, we'd, we'd work like maniacs and we'd build a new build and we'd, we'd deploy it and clear that roadblock and then another one come up and we'd be like, yep, we need to address that. And How intense was that time? It must have been crazy. Um, it like ruined our summer. Yeah, I bet. It really did. It must Remember been. that kid? That kid was there. It like ruined our summer, man. 70, like 80 hour weeks, issues, it sounded right? like, yeah. But uh, we finally got to a point where the... Uh, so you spend your summer putting out fires, hoping you just get them out in time. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, we loved the work and we had a strong commitment to the customer. And like at the time, like me and Mike Tamino, we became really, really good friends. And we used to talk about like how we would act like, uh, you know, like boyfriend and girlfriend on the phone. Like, hey, what are you doing? Like, I'm doing this, you know, we were working through it. But anyways, we get to the point where... We get to the point where like uh, the system is deployed and it's working and those mean paralegals in New York were no longer mean and they were happy. And our executive sponsor over at DLA was like, okay, Andrew, so glad the project's done. Um, we appreciate the extra effort on for, for, for what you've done on the project. What do we owe you? And I was like, you know what, man, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, we kind of botched this up a little bit, so it's on us. He goes, aren't you a small company? Don't you really need the money? Are you, aren't you? probably hurting, are you? I'm like, well, yeah. He goes, well, what do we owe you? I'm like, 80 grand. Cut us a check for 80 grand. We, we kept going. But I think for us, for us, for us, this was, I think, a really important moment in, uh, in KKR history uh, because, you know, three months later after we, we finally fixed the solution and then DLA Piper made, it, made, made a decision to buy a site license of relativity, right? We bought for the entire firm, U.S., wow. Right, um, it's a 400 seat license. It's a quarter million dollar uh, deal, and to us that was, you know, a huge amount of money. Um, and when the woman who, you know, ran the practice, like when she like signed the contract and she slid it across the table to me, and she's like, Andrew, you know, like relativity doesn't even come close to doing what we need to do today. But we know that like you and Kit and Regina and Keith and Nick and Don and you know, she named like all eight people at the company at the time, that you guys will do whatever it takes f for us to be successful. And that's why we're buying this product. And if we've never like screwed up the Flex project, we could never show them what we were capable of and they would never have built that commitment to our, our company mm -hmm. and our business. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, if we didn't fuck up Flex, we would have never got the, the relativity project. They would have never bought relativity. I, I think it was fundamental, and, and that changed the course of our, our business. It's amazing. Well, it says a lot. Um, you know, I found that with Lante Culture, we had a product that you worked. We're going to work on it. Unfortunately, if, I, if you'd come, I'd be much more successful. But um, the, uh, you know, when stuff wasn't right, people sort of that's that was very much how people handle it. And I think not everybody handles it that way. Yeah, I think uh, you know when you look at, in a world of customer service, I mean people. People don't really notice when things are going well, right? It's when things are going bad, they notice. And how are you going to act? Right. Are you going to be accountable or are you going to point the finger? Mm -hmm. Are you going to just wait to get something resolved? Or are you going to do whatever it takes to get it done? Mm -hmm. right? You can really show your customer what you're made of when you screw up. Yeah, that's right. Well, right? I think there's no question that um, we had a vendor once came into us, and they had been successful during the bump, right in the boom, and then... The, I wasn't sure if they were going to make it, and he came in to see me, and they were, they, were exp they were sending us data extracts. They were extracting data for us from these legacy systems and sending it to us. And he came to see us when he, we'd be getting empty files. I mean, you know, we got a file, but it was empty. So we called up, and they said, we said, you know, what's, what's going on? We're sending the files. I said, but they're empty. Like, you know, a bag with nothing doesn't help us load our systems. And he comes in, and he said, I just want to tell, we all have to take responsibility. And I said, what, for getting empty files? I mean, it was, it was one of these things, and you look and you say, it really told you a lot about who they were. Because everybody's great when they're selling you something, and yep. the times are good. But, you know, they didn't jump in and say, hey, obviously we got a problem, and here's what we're doing to fix it, and we're pulling out all the stops. And, you know, that was a vendor that didn't last with us. And that business really hadn't grown since the bubble burst, and I think a lot of it was that, was that their culture couldn't withstand adversity. 
Um, and I think that's a great testament to why you have one of the most successful private B2B SaaS companies out there. It's a great story. Um, I want to continue on. We talk a little bit about, um, you got a bunch of questions here I want to make sure I cover. Um, but uh, one of the things that we've talked a little bit about was, um, we were getting ready for this, and we're friends from YPO, is um, there's a lot of free out there in the world. We live in a free software world. And, um, and we talked a little bit about your experience of what you, know, what you, you all did. Talk about your thoughts on, um, is free the, is it the express lane or is it a bad shortcut when you're starting a business with early product? No. Um, I, I think it's really important to have there be some type of exchange of dollars if you're buying some type of good or service. And um, Talk about why. Well, again, it just comes down to ensuring that the other side has some type of commitment to especially if you're trying to take a, a product to market, right? Like, and you're gonna get, you wanna get people to use the software where, you know, there's a, there's a time commitment involved, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta spend the time, you gotta learn it, you have to, you know, if you're gonna be migrating data from like one system to another, you have to do that. There might be some issues that you then have to get on the phone with to help resolve. And so, you know, if there isn't the exchange of the money, right, it's kinda easy for someone to just go like, ah, you know what, the thing doesn't work and I'll just, I'll just, you know, just use what I'm using. Yeah, you know, we right. find that we when we do pilots. Have we ever done free pilots? Yeah. And those skin in the game, they have no they have no interest in your success. Yeah, it's it's really important. I think it maybe in like the you know the in in, in you know a a B a B to C scenario where like uh, you know you're trying to get a bunch of consumers and the app is maybe not as complicated or it doesn't have any migration requirements or something. You, yeah, right. You know, and obviously, it's very successful in all kinds of different. That is the other thing is, I mean, you know, I, my dad used to laugh. He'd say, tell them how much work you're doing. People, you know, if people know how much work you're doing, A, they'll pay for it. And B, if, if they don't, then they don't respect what you're doing anyway. Yeah. Because nobody, nobody, if, if they really think it's going to be valuable to them, they want you to be successful like DLA Piper. Yeah, does. and I think ultimately people want to, they want to work with people who they like and they do want you to be successful. And I think, I mean, people are willing to pay for a good, Service. So, in seven years since that moment, uh, that watershed moment, you know, you've scaled this business incredibly. And I, what would be the best way to describe the scale that you are you've reached today? Yes. Yeah, so I would I, I would say in uh, you know in two thousand in two thousand in two thousand eight in the beginning of two thousand eight we uh, we probably had um, six deployments of the software um, maybe. 1,100 end users using it, or maybe like active licenses using it. Um, you know, you fast forward to today, um, we've got over 110,000 end users in the software. We've got uh, 56,000 cases being managed in relativity. Um, over 41 billion files or emails under management. Um, um, the, so it's, the, it, the scale is incredible, and the growth is incredible. I mean, without disclosing anything confidential, I'll yeah. say it's it's amazing how you continue to grow. Yeah. Talk about how, because you know, you you had some interesting dynamics to your ability to scale the the revenue model in terms of getting it. Uh, help people understand a little bit. There were some interesting kind of quasi virality dynamics to what you what you all did that I think are interesting for people to learn from. Yeah, I, and I think you know we, another area where we got really lucky is that we figured out a a, a business model that really really worked and um, and we didn't really get that lift until the end of like 2007 um, and we decided like that one of the best ways that we could take the product to market was to partner with these litigation consulting firms so there's all these consulting firms that help a company through a large litigation project and we can we could effectively partner with them and they'll they'll buy our software and they'll deploy it in their data center and they'll charge a huge markup for it, and they'll make tons of money, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll go to market with them. But we didn't, we didn't necessarily like uh, do like a, a a rev share, right? We basically made it where they have to do a three-year commitment by a hundred users. They cut us a check, and at the time it was seventy grand, and it was enough skin in the game where they were really committed to the technology, and uh, and so then the consulting firm would would work really hard to make sure that the the technology worked and the ultimate end user would have a good experience. And then when the end user would have a good experience, they would then, and like, like law firms are effectively like a, a federation of sole proprietorships, right? And so if partner A had a good experience with, with the product, 
Um, she might tell like, you know, the department down the hallway mm -hmm. and then when she had a new project, then she would request relativity as well. Didn't they have like yeah. co-councils in a lot of places? Yeah, and so you might have a joint defense group or, you know, three different outside firms using the same technology and then that person goes into it and then they have like a good experience with it and they ask for the product by name and then it might be a consulting firm who doesn't use our product and all of a sudden, you know, they're calling us or... Then a it's bit, interesting dynamics yeah. because trying to do that knocking on doors is hard. Yeah, I, th I think like again, what, what was lucky about like our 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 business is that, you know, a lot of a lot of software applications are, you know, they're there to like automate some type of process and provide some type of return on investment. And the salespeople got to go and help them calculate that. And where our 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 product was a little bit different in that like, you you had a serious, you had a problem. I am being sued. I like need something like now. Mm -hmm. Right, and so there's an event, and then people go out and they go go to bid for like, okay, what software solution are we gonna use? And like, well, we'll try relativity on this one, and then that was our chance. You so know? what's what's allowed you to have market leadership? Oh, I, I, I would say two, really just two things. Well, one is, um, you know, we really we really provided like the best technology, but we also bundled it with the best service and support. Um, you know, we're known in the legal industry as being like the gold standard in providing exceptional customer service. And this is something like, you know, customer service on the software side is traditionally pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And we're definitely not like that. We handled our customers through everything. Great. We've got a few questions we always go through at the end here, but I wanted to take some questions from the audience here. And I appreciate people upvoting. It makes it a lot easier. Uh, in general, when is the best time for a founder to leave her full-time job and focus 100% on her startup? Uh, that might be from Beth. Yeah, you know, I, I think that that's a good question, right? I think uh, and it's there's probably no cookie-cutter answer. I mean, one is it depends on your, your own financial situation, right? So can you afford to, can you afford to, to, to spend all of your time um, working on your endeavor? Um, I, I would just say as soon as possible. As soon as you so, so heads down is better than mitigating risk, like putting going all in. I, I, I would say so, yeah. yeah. But you know, it's uh, when young, young engineers might come up to me at Kikura and they're like, uh, um, you know, they they have entrepreneurial aspirations and they're like, uh, you have any advice for me? I'm like, I've got three. So number one, become a master at your trade. Don't quit just yet. Give me another like two years. <laughs> right? Get really good at programming. Number two, when you're really good at programming, go take a severe pay cut and go to sales, right? And learn how to sell software. And then three, don't load yourself up with debt, right? Because I think that's the biggest thing that like prevents, uh, and sometimes point. people approach me like, oh, you know, I got this idea and, you know, and they're not willing to like put their own money into it or like, you know, it's like, well, if you got a bunch of debt, you know, you have to. Yeah, yeah. that's a big, it's a, it's a great point. Yeah. Um, so those early days, you had some, you had some, um, you know, up and down early days, like all companies do, particularly in that time period. I mean, that you 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 started this company in the what we was popularly called nuclear winter for tech companies. Um, how did you keep your team engaged and morale positive oh. in those days? Um, I mean, it was all about. I mean, we 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 were we were like, I mean, early Kikura was was an awesome crew. But guys. I mean, we were like the, the band of misfits. Anyone who was willing to join like our knucklehead you, come on board. And, um, and it, was, uh, it, was, it was like us versus the world, right? And, um, and I think a, a lot of the guys like bought into that and uh, we really enjoyed working with each other. We loved technology and it was fun. And uh, I think in these, the early team didn't get paid a lot of money either. In fact, they probably got paid 60% of like what their market value were, but you know, they kind of believed in what we were doing. They were having fun along with the way. Well, that goes to the next question, which is how did you, what did you learn about building a great team? Um, you know, I guess you kind of learn it along, along the way. Um, I think you, you, you pick it up from great team members, right? So, you know, you, you get like a, uh, you bring someone on board and they're awesome in all these different dimensions and they're like, hey, you want, you want someone who's like that and you, you, try, to, you try, to, try to find that again, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And there's a question here about the name. Where'd the name come from? Okay, Kira. So uh, the idea is we were going to build knowledge management applications on top of this platform. And every name that we came up that had like a KM spin to it or knowledge management spin, if you went to www.thename.com, it would be taken. And so one of, one of the guys was like flipping through the dictionary and then he saw that Cura meant management in Latin and then we put K in front of it, K Cura, knowledge management, www.kcura.com, available. Nice. <laughs> Not easy to do, nice. Um, oh, this is a really important question. Why do I wear jeans to every event? Because um, that's what I wear to work every day, I guess. <laughs> this is how I dress at work, so I just come from work. This, um, Probably upvote more relevant questions in the future. <laughs> um, so let's talk about uh, one of the questions was funding. People asked about your experience in yeah. VC funding. The company is 12 years old. And in those 12 years of getting to the Momentum Award, like I think one of the notable things when you were up for the Momentum Award against really some fantastic companies here in Chicago was a, our, uh, we had five years, I was told how we had five years worth of winners to vote. It was hard but you guys were clearly the um, front of that pack. What's incredible to me is you had, I think you were the only, one of only two companies there that hadn't raised money in building the business. Um, first of all, how'd you do it without doing that? And second, why? Well, I mean, you could take money off the table, you couldn't take money to, 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 to scale, but you got it all the way to this point without it. How come? Yeah, I, I, think, I think one was, you, know, you hear all these scary stories about venture capital, right? Mm -hmm. The VCs come in, they come in and take a big chunk of your business, they're gonna drive you to like hit a home run and at all costs, mm -hmm. I mean, you hear all these, these scary stories and I think there's, there's probably some VCs that are really bad but I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of money that's really good as well too, right? So you hear these stories about you know, bad VCs and it's like, hey, you know what, do we really, you know, we, we would rather like just run the business that is in the best interest of our customers and our employees. And we don't want any type of short-term you know, financial gain cloudy like our decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So that was, that, was, that was one reason um, why we decided not to do it. Two is like I just wasn't smart enough, right? I really did try to like raise money and no one would give it to me. Um, That's one of the great lines, by the way, which yeah. is um, you got to appreciate it gets Bessemer, has a wall. It's anti-portfolio. It puts all its most successful ones on the wall to remind them that they're not as smart as they think they are. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of people. Of course, in the last two years, I'll say, I get venture guys who call me like, do you know Andrew? Could you get me with Andrew? I'm like, you need to call Andrew yourself. But you obviously have built a business that has a lot of attraction to, to, to all of them. Um, you've built a fantastic business. As you look out at the next decade, yeah. you're 12 years in, What's your vision for what this could be? What's the ultimate sort of incarnation of what this could be? Yeah. So uh, I think I think I think one is we're pretty lucky to be in a market that is that is it's pretty big and it's growing, right? I mean, it's not ginormous. It's a you know a maybe a, a, a couple billion dollar market, but uh, it's growing at a at a nice clip. And so we have plenty of runway in our in our core market to seriously grow our existing business. So we're pretty mm -hmm. pretty pretty lucky there. And so I. I don't, I don't want to have like any grandiose visions in terms of like other stuff that we're going to do because mm -hmm. we still haven't solved the e-discovery problem yet. Mm -hmm. We still haven't solved the reactive e-discovery problem and we still haven't solved the proactive e-discovery problem. And so there's a lot of work that we need to do there. Now let's ma imagine a situation where we have solved that problem and this is where I think like, you know, Kcura can become a really meaningful software company, right? And I mean meaningful by helping millions of people every day, employing tens of thousands of people, um, having a real serious impact on the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we have the potential to do that. And it's gonna be around managing unstructured information, whether it's for e-discovery or investigations, or just understanding how employees are feeling about their workplace. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of opportunities, document process automation, um, you know, our Especially as you move into the machine learning area. I mean, I think that's, you know, we see that with unstructured text a lot. We're working on some things with that. And I, it's, it looks easy, but it's hard to do well. Yeah. Yeah, and it's more, it's more than just like the machine learning, right? Because mm -hmm. the machine will just go yes or no to, right. like a, to a question that you give it. It's like stitching together 
the workflow around how to like take advantage of the machine learning. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so, always a private company. Could it be a public company someday? I'm not saying you. That's your dream. I'm just saying, do you, as you look at the world, would you be? Would that be something you'd ever entertain, or do you think? Uh, I always want to be private, hell or high water. Yeah. Or we'll, we'll see how where the world takes us. Yeah, you know, I think it's like where 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 the world takes us, and you know, we we run the business as if we are going to plan to take it public. So what does that mean? We need the proper accounting infrastructure, right? We need the proper operational infrastructure, right? Some governance and how we do things, right? So we, we run it as if we're going to do that because it's just good business practice. Um, you know, whether that's in the, the future of KCURE, I think it all depends. But if we are gonna do it, right? I mean, think about it. You're gonna take a company public. This is people's retirement's money. It's pension funds. It's, there's like a, a real responsibility mm -hmm. to deliver. Yeah, serious. People laugh because, like, uh, yeah, no, I'm serious. Like, and if if we're going to do it, and I'm going to go up and, pr and talk to people about, hey, here's the performance of the business, and we project over the next five five years we're going to do X. Well, I personally got to be have a boatload of conviction that mm -hmm. we can get there. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? It does. It does. Um, I know the bankers would love you to do it because it's a great business, but uh, it does make a lot of sense, and I. You know, it really reminds you how you're building a business for the long term. A uh, couple final questions we always ask. Um, first one is lessons learned. Are there things you'd always do again and things you'd, boy, I'd never do that again? Uh, I, I think the bootstrapping was really smart for Kekura, and I would recommend, uh, you know, if any type of startup to, to, to get to, to bootstrap your business and get to a point where it's actually generating some money and, and if it can like generate enough money to sustain it at, at an almost like you know small level, I think that's really good and I think that's really healthy. Um, and I think it's been a real healthy thing for KCURE that you know we've always made money, we've always turned a, a real healthy profit. It you know puts a lot of like good discipline into the business, and so I wouldn't have changed that. I think you know again dumb luck. I couldn't I couldn't raise the money, but it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to us as a business. Mm -hmm. um, um, how about things you'd never do again? Like, boy, I learned that if I ever had to do this over again, I would not do this again. You know, I, I think some of the things that I, I really struggled with in, in, in with Kura and being a young engineer is like, you know, you had a, you had to learn. I had to learn how to sell, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy skill. And it's another thing when I when I think when, you know, engineers knock salespeople, right? I just talked about when like you know business people won't, like minimize technical stuff, it's, it it's also goes the other way around. It's a really tough skill. And it also requires a lot of, you gotta be brave to go up to somebody and you yeah. know, pitch your service or go in front of a bunch of people and talk about your product maybe when it's not there yet. And so it's learn how to sell and then you know, learn how to manage people, right? And so if you, can, if you can somehow build these skills in your professional job before you start, I think you'd be, way better equipped to be successful in your entrepreneur adventure. Endeavor. I think that makes a lot of sense. Mark Andreessen talks about how people think, you know, if you build it, they will come. Meanwhile, distribution is one of the big killers or lack of ability to get traction is a big reason why companies don't make it. If you're going to be a B2B, you almost always have to sell it. There's, yeah. you know, one in a million that goes viral, but. You got to build it, you got to sell it, and you got to service it. Yep. And all three of those things are not that easy. No. No, they're all, that's right. Um, so you're incredibly busy with your business. You're building a great business. Um, but you have spent a little bit of time with um, startups, particularly ones in where you can understand around your adjacency. Any companies that you look at, and boy, that'll be a company to watch. They're doing exciting mm -hmm. things. Um, well, I, I got to tell you, I'm not, I'm not terribly too involved in the, the Chicago tech community, right? Like, and so uh, outside of hanging out with you, and I got some buddies here. And, Stuff, but uh, there, there are a couple of companies that you know we have very close relationships with that I'm personally pretty excited about. Um, you know, one is this group called uh, Scholastica, mm -hmm. right? And if you guys heard of them, they uh, they're 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 in the legal space, ki kind of in the legal space, but they, they have this business that uh, that's all about that helps with the, uh, the the publishing of like academic journals and papers. And um, you know, there's there's three guys who started the business, um, Rob Cody and um, why am I thinking of it? Yeah, help me. Rob, Rob, 
Rob, Rob, Brian, and Corey. Sorry, sorry, guys. Um, uh, I think I think. We'll edit that part. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm nervous up here. Um, yeah, great story. Yeah, but uh, you know, I think I think what's really special about these guys, and I've only spent you know a, a, a little bit of time with them, right? Like, mm -hmm. is you you meet you meet some entrepreneurs, and the, you know they get they get they get really excited and like, you know they get really excited about you know starting a business and doing their company and like running around in 1871 and speaking on panels and all this other stuff, and it seems f fake. Yeah. But then, you guys probably know it. But then there's these guys are different, man. They like they're really passionate about the problem that they're solving and the impact they can have, and like the excitement is. It's like infectious, mm -hmm. you know? So I think they're pretty cool. That is cool. And then, uh, and then, and then we got, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's three K-Cure guys that, uh, that left to start their own thing, and they're, you know, they're building this analytics engine that's, that's pretty exciting. It's pretty cutting edge. They're working with uh, uh, some folks at the, the University of Chicago on this thing. And, you know, it's, it's one of those technologies that are, it's a far reach, you know? Mm -hmm. And... You know, one of the guys is like, uh, is, you know, is, he was like my right hand man at Kikura for for eight years, and wow. and he left his doing own, own thing, and and they're doing some really cool stuff. So, and that's Next LP. So I think, cool. they, yeah, they just raised like two million dollars, like, what, six weeks ago, six months ago, something like that. Yeah. Shit, I'm too late. Well, the uh, <laughs> darn, I should have done this twelve months ago. Um, so you started and have built one of the great tech firms in Chicago, one of the great SaaS companies, uh, not just in your industry, but in the country. And you did it out of what is known as the nuclear winner in the post-bubble world. What's your view on, uh, on Chicago for founding and starting a company today versus when you did it? What are the pros? What are the cons? How do you see it for entrepreneurs starting out today, like your, your former colleagues? I mean, look, I mean, look at this. I mean, this is, this is epic in terms of like what what you guys have here in terms of resources and a network and a community and people just to like help you out with stuff. I mean, this was, we didn't even come close to having anything like this. No, that's right. Like nothing like it. I mean, uh, and, and having like this community and this support has got to be really awesome, right? And um, not just that, there's, you know, they talk about like the access to like capital and money. I mean, yeah, I think, I think you have it now, right? And, you know, I've, I've met a lot of, venture type of people in the city and they seem really eager to invest in like good ideas and sp specifically good entrepreneurs as well and so um, and you could probably be a little bit of knucklehead in like raising uh, money these days <laughs> right or maybe maybe 10 years ago you uh, you, you couldn't That's so right. it's it's an it's an exciting time and, you know the economy still looks pretty good and um, you know you never know what might happen a few months from now but like right now it seems it seems good it does. Well, you listen, you've built a great company. Uh, it's been a great story to share. Um, still being written, of course. You're one of the great leaders in our community, building a great business and a great founder. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much.